choose the humble and raise them high. You choose the weak and make them strong. You heal the brokenness inside and give us life. The same love that set the captives free. The same love that opened eyes to see is calling us all by name. You were calling us all by name. The same God that spread the heavens wide. The same God that was crucified is calling us all by name. You are calling us all by name. You choose the faithless one aside and speak the words you are mine. You call the cynic and the proud, come to me now. The same love that set the captives free, the same love that opened eyes to see, is calling us all by name. You are calling us all by name. The same love that spread the heavens wide, the same God that was crucified, is calling us all by name. to our service today and so glad that you're able to join us uh, whether that's on Sunday morning or Sunday afternoon or sometime during the week it's just really wonderful that you have uh, made some time to join with us in uh, singing and praising God in worship and uh, prayer and in, in studying and hearing the word um, for those who may not know me my name is Deb Roberts and I serve here as the director of congregational care just a couple of announcements, announcements before we begin. Um, as you know, there are still ministries going on through Zoom um, and those uh, are happening uh, during the week, each week. And so if you'd like to join with the uh, fellowship at drop-in on Tuesday afternoons, um, there's also Bible study uh, Wednesday evening, uh, another ladies Bible study on Thursday afternoon. And the links for each of those is available through our webpage. So, uh, direct you to that place. Uh, in addition, of course, uh, we want to continue to remember our congregation and those uh, that you know who are in need of prayer. And so if you uh, feel that you would like to submit a prayer request on behalf of yourself or someone else, uh, you can use uh, uh, community.care community uh, as uh, the place to go and place a prayer request there. Well, today in our culture and society, we mark it as Mother's Day. And, you know, traditionally at Knox, um, we have uh, honored the women in our church uh, with flowers. And this year, um, because of the logistics of doing that and some of the practical difficulties, um, the church has decided instead to make a donation, the funds that would normally go towards purchase of flowers um, this year are going to make, be made uh, as a donation 
to Shifra House in Burlington. Uh, Shifra House is a home for uh, young, homeless, and pregnant young women. And it's a home that can accommodate five women at one time. And they provide good aftercare as well, and all, so many different uh, social services supports. You'd be interested to know that Shifra, the name is a Hebrew name, meaning beautiful or lovely. And it's actually the name of a midwife whose uh, story is told in Exodus 1. And it's quite an interesting story. Uh, there are two midwives involved and they're quite clever and actually quite humorous as well. So I direct you to that. The funds that we are giving will go to a project that they are doing this year to replace uh, mattresses and box springs for the home. Uh, and so if you would like to make a donation, uh, we'd be happy to have you join the church and uh, you can send a donation if you'd like to um, Knox and mark your donation as Shifra, S-H-I-F-R-A Homes, either uh, by your e-transfer or on your check. And uh, I know uh, not everybody is a mother, but we've all had mothers. So if this is some way that you would like to honor your mother, we'd be happy for you to join the church in making this donation. So uh, we end the announcement time. And as we go into worship, let us go together, uh, rejoicing in this day that God has given us and joining our hearts and our minds and our spirits to come and worship our Lord. One final announcement this morning, and that is to welcome officially Blaine Cameron as our newest elder serving on session. After a overwhelmingly successful election, uh, we are pleased to announce that Blaine has been elected to be an elder at Knox, and he has begun serving actively on session. We are gonna hold off doing Blaine's ordination because we're online, because we can't be in a building together. We're gonna to do that when we are able to celebrate together. We think that that's gonna be the most meaningful way to ordain Blaine, lay hands on him, and uh, to pray for him and his family as he continues to serve in this way. So one thing that you can do right now for us at Knox, and that is you can pray for Blaine and for his family, pray for the Cameron family. One thing that we know is that when somebody serves as an elder, they're serving, they're doing good work. It asks something of them. It also asks something of their family. So would you pray for Blaine and would you pray for the whole Cameron family as he begins this new role at Knox. Again, we're delighted to announce this. The vote was 57 to zero. And uh, so we're excited about just how much support we have for Blaine as he begins this role. So again, thanks to Blaine for stepping into this new role. We are praying for you and uh, we're excited to see what God is going to do through you and through the session, the leadership at Knox Church over the weeks and months and years to come.
Well, hey, everybody, it is great to have you worshiping with us. Thank you for continuing to join us for worship online. It's good to be together, and it's good to open up the Bible. We're going to do that. We're going to open up the Bible to Acts 9 this morning. We are wrapping up our sermon series called On the Road with Jesus, where we've been looking at the accounts of Jesus post-resurrection uh, with his disciples. So meeting the disciples, convincing them that he's alive, that he is who he says he is post-resurrection, the disciples figuring it out, you know, taking some time to figure it out. And uh, last week we focused on the ascension. We looked at Jesus's command to be my witnesses. He says, you will be my witnesses in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We looked at our role as being witnesses in the world. You might have thought, hey, that's a great place to end, and it probably would have been, um, but I wanted to do one last sermon in this series, somewhat along the lines of, but what about us? And uh, it's not to make everything about us, that's, that's not the point, but I think that it can become really easy to look at the accounts of Jesus and his disciples and say, that's great. They had Jesus in front of him. It's great that they believe they could feel the holes in his hands, they could touch the wounds in his side, they could talk to him, they could eat meals with him. Like They had the dude in front of them in order to convince them that he was alive, and we don't. We talked a little bit last week about the Holy Spirit and the gift of God's presence in the world, but yet we know that it's different. It's different. It's not the same as the disciples. It's not the same as what we have been looking at. We can't touch the hands of Jesus. We can't touch the wounds in his side or eat a meal with him in, in the same way as the disciples were able to. And so maybe you've been sitting there thinking exactly that. That's great for the disciples, but what about us? And so I wanted to look at a story in Acts that is a lot more similar to our situation, and that is a man who met Jesus post-resurrection, but also post-ascension, and who believed and whose life was turned completely around because of it. So I'm going to read Acts 9. I'm actually going to read uh, the whole, I think, 22 verses of it. It's not quite the whole chapter, but our whole portion of text this morning. 
in one shot. And then I want to look at two key players in it and one good reminder for you, especially if you call yourself a Christian and uh, are a follower of Jesus watching this morning. So Acts 9, I'll throw it up on the screen here, but uh, encourage you to read along with me. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's people. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, this is early Christianity, this is early Jesus followers, Whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink. In Damascus there was a man, a disciple, named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus, from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm that he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with the authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim and highlight that my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up, was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Messiah. What I want to do this morning is look at this story really as the story of two players. And what I want you to do is try to picture yourself in the shoes of one or both of these guys we met in Acts 9. Because the reality is, I don't know many people who have a conversion story like Saul. Saul would go on to be known more commonly by his name Paul. Paul was an early church planter, a leader. He wrote much of the New Testament. He wrote letters to early churches that he planted and started and he traveled around preaching the gospel like this dude's heart got grabbed a hold of by Jesus and everything in his life changed. You can see he comes to Damascus. This is, uh, I think it's it's over 100 kilometers anywhere from, from Jerusalem to Damascus. He's traveling there to persecute the Christians, to arrest them and bring them back to Jerusalem. He's got permission to do that. He's able to do that because the high priest in those days, the high priest and the Jewish officials were were designated or given power and authority by the Romans to bring order and stability to the, the Jewish religion and practices. So they had oversight. They had power, they had authority over the things that happened in the synagogues uh, by Jewish people. And so Saul's got authority. He's got the power to do it. Uh, Doubly so because later on we see that Paul or Saul is from Tarsus and Tarsus, if you were born in Tarsus, you were a Roman citizen. So Saul has this like dual uh, authority or protection about him. 
And this guy was feared. He was feared by the early church. I mean, I can only imagine the reaction when the early followers of Jesus heard that he was coming to Damascus. And not only that, when they heard that he had had this encounter when Ananias is sent to Saul, you know, his, his reaction is clear. Like he protests. He, he's not sure that it's the safe play to, to make. In fact, he's pretty sure it's not the safe play. And you can just think about what's going through his mind in those moments. Like maybe, maybe Saul is pretending. Like maybe this is all a ruse to, to get me to go. My guard's down. I'm not sure what's going to, and then I'm, I'm going to be arrested and taken to Jerusalem. But the reality is, is that Saul's story is a story of a person who meets Jesus. Saul is the story of conversion. He is a convert to Christianity, to what would become Christianity, to this early religion called the way followers of Jesus. Saul, we find out later through his own writings, was a man of high esteem and status within the Jewish culture and religious world. He had power. He had authority. In his own words, he says, I was a Jew among Jews. And yet his entire life is transformed when he meets Jesus. And that's the same thing that God wants to do in your life. He wants to transform it. And so Saul is taken from one who actively persecutes Christians and transformed into one who actively preaches the gospel. He is the convert. His heart is changed. His mind is changed. His life is changed because he meets Jesus. The only thing is that, like I mentioned before, I don't know a lot of conversion stories that happen exactly the way Saul's does. I don't know many people who has this type of slap you in the face, awestruck with light, blind in the eyes type of conversion. I know some whose lives were taken and completely shifted, but that's not my story. Though my life has been completely shifted and shaped by my relationship with God and being known and and loved by God, it wasn't one that was really transformed 100% in the way that Saul's was. My my story with Jesus is gradual. My story with Jesus is, is one of a kid who grew up in the church and whose dad is a pastor and who kind of grew up around the Christian life and culture. I worked at camps and I was given the opportunity to wrestle through my faith in really real ways and important ways throughout my life. And, and though there are moments that I can look back and see that there, that there were decisions made and definitive statements that I would sort of come to in my own mind and conclusions, decisions, There wasn't a one moment where I was headed in one direction and then transformed or completely turned and sent in another direction. Most people's conversion stories are not like Saul's, though some are. And I love the way that N.T. Wright has written and talked about the conversion of Saul because we can get really uh, caught up and focused on the conversion moment, the transformation. This dude was persecuting Christians. He was throwing them in jail and then he was planting churches and he became a, a Jesus follower. Like he was a radical Jew and then he was a radical Christian. Like the dude had one level and one level only. He had high gear and that was it. Like he was either persecuting Christians or he was planting churches. There was no in between for Saul. That's just the kind of person he was. And so we can get so focused on it and think, hey, man, like my story is not like this. Maybe there's something wrong with my story or maybe God's not doing something in my life in the way that that, you know, he did in Saul's or that he wants to do in other people's lives. Maybe I'm just not good enough or don't believe enough or don't have enough faith. Like these are thoughts that we can get trapped in, especially those of you who have grown up in the church. I know because those are thoughts that I have had growing up as a kid in the church and not having a story like this that are often glorified and celebrated as they should be. They should be celebrated. But I think it's important to remember is not how Paul's life was transformed, 
But as N.T. Wright says, that it was transformed. What's, what's less important is the moment, and what is more important is what Paul goes on to do and proclaim. What is more important is the life that he is called to than the life that he was called away from. How that happens is less important than that it happens. And so we see in, in Saul's life, after he is healed, after the scales fall from his eyes, it says he spends several days with the disciples in Damascus, and at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. See, what becomes more important in Saul's life is not his conversion story. It's not how it happened. It's the fact that he now proclaims Jesus as Son of God, Jesus as Messiah. In 22, uh, he says he, he, all the, he baffled all the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. By proving that Jesus is the Messiah. How would he do that? Well, he, he talks about the, the interaction that he had with Jesus, but he, he makes it about Jesus, not about himself. He makes the story and he makes the main player, the main character, he makes the hero of the story, Jesus, and not Saul. He doesn't go and start talking about how, listen, I was the best persecutor of Jews and now I am the best Christian. What he says is, I, listen, I persecuted Jesus. I persecuted Christians until I met Jesus. Now let me tell you what he's like. Now let me tell you God's heart of love toward you. Now let me tell you that nobody is out of the reach of God. Because if I, as a Jew among Jews and as one who persecuted the church and tried to stamp out Christianity, could still be loved by God and saved through the death and resurrection of Jesus, then nobody's off limits. Like nobody's outside of the reach of God. What Saul does is he makes the story about Jesus. What's more important is that it happened and the life that he has turned toward, and that is one of proclaiming Jesus as Messiah. And so maybe you've got a story similar to Saul. Maybe you have a conversion story in your own, my, in your own life. Maybe you are the convert. The reality of the gospel is that it brings you to a place where you realize that you are either in or you are out. It brings you to a crossroad. One that uh, says, if, if you want the life that Jesus has on offer, there are certain things that you need to give up. Because to proclaim Jesus as Messiah means to turn away from many of the things that we think lead to life. Saul's story is, is just that. It happens in all of our lives at various points and continues to happen in all of our lives at various points. We are brought to moments where we realize that in order to follow Jesus, we need to give up what we've been doing in the past. Saul's brought to this point, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And then Jesus says, I am the one you are persecuting. And Paul's faced with a choice. <laughs> am I going to trust that this is Jesus? Am I going to trust that he is God? Am I going to trust that he is the Messiah? Am I going to trust that he now is alive as he said he would be before his death and then as his disciples have been preaching and teaching since his death? Or am I going to continue living the life that I had been living persecuting Christians? It says Saul's speechless. But they do. They go to Damascus and they meet this man named Ananias. And so the second story that I, I want us to see and I, and I want us to tell today is, is the story of Ananias. Which starts with Jesus calling to Ananias and saying, hey, go and meet this man. Go to Judas' house on Straight Street. Ask for Saul, the, the man from Tarsus, because he's praying. He's praying. And then Ananias <laughs> replies, Probably the way most of us would reply. Um, hey, uh, Lord, have you not heard who this guy is? Like, do you not know why he's here? And, and God's answer is, Jesus' answer is essentially, yes, I know exactly why he's here. And so Ananias goes. As he enters the house in 17, verse 17, he places his hands on Saul and he says, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see, be, so that you may see again and be filled 
with the Holy Spirit. And it says that immediately Saul's eyes are healed, his sight is restored, and he gets up and he's baptized just like that. Ananias is the story of a caregiver. One who is compassionate. And one who is called to meet with Saul in the exact moment Saul needs somebody there with him and for him. And so maybe your story and your place in God's economy right now is less about Saul and is less about a conversion and is more about being a caregiver. Maybe the way that God is calling you to participate in his mission in the world is to be a caregiver, one who is there for people when they need you. One who accompanies somebody in and on the journey of their conversion. One who heals, one who restores sight, one who invites, one who welcomes, one who says, yeah, I I get that there's maybe a little bit of danger involved, I'm not 100% sure that this dude isn't playing a trick on me and I might end up in prison, but I'm going to trust God enough to go. And I'm going to go and I'm going to meet Saul and I'm going to lay my hands on him and then I'm going to trust God for the rest. Maybe your place is as a caregiver. Maybe you are the one who is called to come alongside somebody as they're wrestling through their faith as they're wrestling through their relationship with God, as they're unsure about what's next. You see, the story of how we continue to meet Jesus is, I think, in many ways, a story of trusting God in small steps and in small ways. Saul, listen, he's not quite sure what's happening, but he trusts God enough to go to Damascus, to the house, to the place where he is sent. And Ananias trusts Jesus to go to that same house and to meet with Saul. And it's in trusting that God shows up for both of these guys. It's in the step, it's in the obedience, it's in the going that God shows up. And so maybe you just need to hear a word of encouragement this morning to say that we, we may not be able to see Jesus the way in which the first disciples were able to see Jesus, but we can still see the effect that Jesus has on lives. And you are still called to have an effect on others' lives as you are invited to partner with Jesus. Don't hear me say go preach to people, go tell them how terrible they're living their lives and how much better they would be if they just believed in Jesus. I want to be very careful here. Ananias doesn't go to Saul and say, hey, Saul, like, remember how terrible of a person you were? Like, do you remember all of the people you threw into prison? Like, let's talk about those guys before we talk about giving your sight back. He, he doesn't go in and say, hey, uh, Saul, like, you're blind. That's really great for Christians. So um, let's just make sure that you're not going to go back and continue to persecute. Like, Ananias trusts God for that moment. And you might be entrusted with somebody with a Saul, with somebody who's on their journey, the early stages of their journey with Jesus, and what they need is a caregiver. What they need is somebody to come alongside them. What they need is somebody who has compassion and who isn't judgmental and is going to love them. There's a great quote, and uh, I can't remember who first said it. I've heard it a number of different ways from a number of different pastors. Just know that it's this isn't like my, I didn't come up with this. So very rarely are people argued into Christianity. Very, very rarely are people argued into a relationship with Jesus that brings life. Far more likely are they to be loved into a relationship with Jesus, loved into the church, loved into Christianity, and, and that's what Ananias does. Ananias, in going and answering the call of God, of Jesus, loves Saul. But the first word to him is brother Saul. And it's a word of embrace. And so whether you've got a conversion story like Saul that you are called to share, whether you've got a story that makes Jesus the hero of it, that you are called to 
tell others, whether you are called in your stage to be Ananias to somebody else, to be a caregiver, one who is compassionate, just know, know at the end of the day, God wants to use you in the world to change lives. And that Jesus is still in the business of getting a hold of hearts and minds and transforming them into the hearts and the minds and the lives that they were created to be. The reality of the gospel, as I said, is it brings us to a place where we have a decision to make. Are we gonna trust Jesus or are we going to turn from Jesus? Are we gonna answer the call to go or are we gonna sit back and not get our hands dirty? Are we gonna take risks? Are we gonna put ourselves into positions and places that are awkward and uncomfortable and potentially even dangerous because Jesus is calling us to go? Or are we gonna protect our own interests and watch from the sidelines? I hope what you've seen through this series is that when you meet Jesus, you're presented with an incredible offer an incredible life, something that can bring life to others, something that can share love with others, something that can give generously because you've received generously. The disciples go, many of them giving up their lives because of what they've received, because they met Jesus post-resurrection. Saul transformed his life, gave up everything that he had as a Jewish elite, for the sake of preaching the resurrection of Jesus, ends up in prison a couple times and is persecuted for being a follower of, of Jesus. And yet they go, they go, because they know that the love that Jesus has on offer for the world is worth the risk. And so my prayer for you and my prayer, especially if you call yourself a member of Knox Church, is that we together would learn to risk for the sake of loving the world. Let me pray. God, thanks that you love us, and uh, thanks that you loved us so much that you sent Jesus to die on a cross so that we could know uh, life to the full and a life lived in relationship with you. Thanks that this is something that people have been wrestling with and through for thousands of years now that we're not the first to have doubts. We're not the first to ask questions. We're not the first to wrestle it out. We're, we're not the first to be called into something beyond ourselves. We're not the first to uh, become followers of Jesus. And yet you care about each one. And so, God, I, I pray that as we continue to figure this out together as a church, you would call us to answer that invitation to go, that you would challenge us to risk for the sake of reaching people with your love and your grace and your mercy, that you would call us to embrace the uncomfortable and awkward places in life because it's worth somebody else knowing just how much you love them. So God, would you continue to unfold a vision in front of us that is larger than we could imagine? Would you continue to challenge us to go? And God, would you continue to transform hearts and minds like you did Saul's? Would you continue to raise up uh, caregivers, compassionate ones like Ananias? Would you continue to bring people to places to proclaim the name of Jesus to those who need to hear it? And it's in that name, the name of Jesus, that we pray. Amen.
come to a time in our worship now where we draw together in prayer. And first of all, before we do that, can I just share with you, uh, I was speaking with one of our congregation this week and I was so encouraged. I was saying, how are you doing? And uh, they said, well, they told me some of the things that they're doing. And then they said, but you know, I've been praying a lot more and people have been sending me prayer requests uh, for things in their lives. And this was such an encouragement to me that um, this person recognized that uh, during this time, when she didn't have a lot of other things that was able to do, she could spend that time in prayer. And I know that God will bless uh, the prayers. We talk, talks about the prayers um, being raised as incense to God. And so I just uh, want to be grateful and thankful for the ways people are continuing to minister during this time. But let us join together in prayer. Let us pray. Creator and sustainer and giver of life, we stand in awe of the vastness and complexity and diversity of life in this world you brought forth. In this season of spring, we see the earth flourishing again with immense color and designs. Yet we know this life begins imperceptibly. As the songwriter reminds us, in the bulb there is a flower, in the seed an apple tree. In cocoons, butterflies will soon be free, something only you, O oh God, can see. And what is true of nature is also true of us. Before the foundations of the earth were formed, before we came to be, O oh God, you knew us. And as we came to believe in your saving work, you knew the potential of our life hidden in Christ with you. Just as we see nature slowly revealing the life within seed and bulb, so too our new life in you is a slow work towards holiness and righteousness. As our trust in you grows, you through the Spirit begin to reveal your fruit in our lives, the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. We, like the Apostle Paul, recognize, O oh Lord, that we have not reached full maturity in this life. But the promise you give is that as we look to you, focus our attention on you, keep connected to you, the vine, we will continue to be transformed into the image of Christ. We confess the distractions of this world and our own wills get in the way of remaining in you. We get pulled away so often and so easily from you into our own plans and routines, our own ideas and perspectives, holding tightly and proudly to our thinking and our concepts of abundant life. Thank you that you do not turn away or give up on us. That when we recognize and acknowledge our life has become dry and weak, and empty of vitality, you are there to draw us back into the abundance of your mercy and your grace and your love so that we can continue to grow and mature in your life in us. We pray today for those who through this continuing period of restrictions and limitations are feeling life as arid and weary. May their souls cling to you, knowing your right arm, your strength and power upholds them. Help them through your spirit to turn anew to you so they can be refreshed in your life. We especially remember today those women who nurture and provide for others. We thank you for women who teach, encourage, discipline, and pray for those who have come into their lives. 
We pray that they will look to you for guidance as an example of one who gives and sustains physical and spiritual life. We continue to pray for an end to this disease that has so devastated millions around the world. And we look to that day when all disease, sickness, and death is no more. And we live and reign with you in a new and gloriously remade world. We look forward to this time, but also want to remain faithful to you. And we pray all these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and the one who empowers us through the Spirit, our loving God. Amen. Thanks for joining us today, and may God go with you, and may you know his presence every step of your way this week. We'll see you later. Bye now.